Hello, good evening, and uh, welcome again to our final installment in this ongoing series in which we've been engaging with the Protestant Reformation. I want to uh, trust that this has been a profitable time for you, as it has also been uh, uh, for us over here. And uh, I'm so delighted to have had your company all through the three weeks that we've been together in a total of nine lectures. Um, and and it's, been, it's, been, it's been a privilege for me and an honor to be able to come to you with these messages. Now what I'm going to be doing shortly now then is to engage with lecture nine. And in lecture nine, we are dealing with a question really. Do we need another reformation? Do we need another reformation? Uh, in his book, Michael Reeves writes in his book, The Unquenchable Flame, in the very last chapter of this book, The Unquenchable Flame, by Michael Reeves, he titles that chapter, which is chapter 7, actually. Yeah, chapter 7, he titles it, Is the Reformation Over? Is the Reformation Over? Are we done with the Reformation? Is it done and dusted? Should we all rest easy that everything is done? And of course, he'll argue there that the task is unfinished. And that's exactly what I will be arguing for today, that in fact, the task is unfinished. That in fact, we do need another reformation. Now, do permit me, if you may, to read a text which I believe then should inspire us, not particularly in terms of his exegetical uh, relevance, but so much because of its inspirational uh, relevance here. The text is in Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. And uh, I want us to draw some inspiration from that text by the grace and by the will of God, and hopefully then launch into what we've got to do. I'm hoping this won't be a very long lecture. I plan that it should be short, but uh, I know a man, uh, my brother Barnabas, who might say something like that, and I launch into a very, very long one. <laughs> and we usually joke with my brother that he speaks apostolically. Uh, I sometimes do that, and... Um, and so on. And, uh, you know, Paul, Paul, when he was preaching, he preached for so long that somebody fell asleep up in the balcony and that guy uh, fell and died. And so we sometimes make a joke out of that, that apostolic speaking is very long, but that's tongue in cheek. It's, it's a joke we make. But then uh, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, from verse 19. And again, just to reiterate, my hope is that this lecture will not be long. And so you want to be engaged from the word go because I will hit the ground as it were running. I will hit the ground running. So Acts chapter 3 uh, from verse 19 and I will move over I think to verse 21. By the grace and by the will of God see that which the Lord is going to do for us here and tonight. The question or rather the subject we're dealing with is do we need another reformation today? Some reading. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. All right, that was verse 18. So verse 19 then. Repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. All right. So I'm going to take um, verse 19 again and onwards. Repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing might come. The times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord, he says. Interesting words. Mm -hmm. And that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things, 
about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. The reason I'm reading that text is because you sense then the deep desire in the head of this speaker here, looking at an apostate nation, because Israel has apostatized. Israel has gone from the foundations on which Israel was built. Israel has gone far from the moorings of religious fidelity. They have gone away from the Lord. And so, when the New Testament times come and the gospel season comes, they are being called back to righteousness. They are being called back to the way of the faithful. And that had been promised. You remember then in Luke chapter 1, I believe, verse 17, uh, that uh, uh, the angel describes the ministry of John the Baptist, who is the forerunner of Christ. Remember Isaiah talked of a voice in the wilderness, crying, prepare the way of the Lord. So John the Baptist, when his ministry is being described by the angel to Zechariah, he says that this son will bring the hearts of the father back to the sons and the daughters back to the mothers to bring the disobedience to the wisdom of the wise and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And so the ministry of John the Baptist as well as the ministry of Christ then becomes a ministry of restoration you could say it is a ministry of reform. It is a ministry of restoration. It is a ministry of reform. And that's why I read that text then in Acts chapter 3, for that desire is not lost on the people. It's a desire you see throughout the Old Testament. When the Old Testament people, the saints of God, from time to time lost the way and embraced other gods, uh, forsook the God of Scripture, the God of their fathers. God sent a revival, but that revival was always preceded by a deep yearning and desire that the presence of God would come again, that the rains will fall on the land again, that in fact there will be crop growing in the field again, and uh, the herds in the stalls will multiply again. Oh, David says, revivers again, O oh Lord, that your people should rejoice. And so, whenever the fortunes of religion have tumbled and diminished and declined, the people of God are pained in their hearts and they cry out, will you revive us again, that the people should rejoice. And so here again, Peter, in the fashion of that, similitude peter now he says that people should repent and obviously in preparing for a reformation there has to be a certain amount of repentance a certain amount of change a certain amount of personal um, transformation and, and, and repent therefore and, and pray that uh, spiritual times of refreshment will come from the presence of the lord again let us make a point here let us make a point here at this stage, a very, very important point. And the point that we want to make is principally and primarily this. That as we think about revival and reformation, we must never think of it as an activity of man. We must never think of it as man-made, as something that men do, as something that men causes as it were, by manipulating a few things, causing a few things here and there to work together for a revival. It doesn't work like that. Revival comes from heaven. Reformation comes from heaven. You know, people have often thought then that the church can be revived by some gimmicks. Charles Grandison Finney, that uh, 19th century revivalist, did say revival, to bring about revival, is pretty much like uh, planting corn. There is a method to it. There is a method to it. You go to the field, you plow the field, uh, you prepare the soil, and then you take the corn, you plant it in there, and then it grows. Maybe after three weeks, we, we're in a farming area here, so I know the process. After three weeks, you go do the first weeding, and then you wait another three weeks, do the second weeding, put manure, and so on and so forth, and then wait for the harvest. It's a mechanical process, Charles Finney thought. And that Finneyistic idea of revival and reform, of renewal and reawakening of the church, 
that, rev that idea of revival, you still find it in a lot of Pentecostal and charismatic churches where they talk about revival meetings, revival meetings. These are those meetings which are specially planned to get people excited. The preacher will speak on a higher note. The music will be more agitated and they say we're in a time of revival. That is not revival, ladies and gentlemen. If true revival will come, if true reform will come, it will come from the presence of God. It will be sent by God in the sovereign design of God in answer to the yearning and prayers of his people. In answer to the yearning and prayers of his people, revival will come, reformation will come. So the speaker here says that times of refreshment, times of revival may come from the presence of the Lord, not from a man, not from a, a, an event or something like that. But let's get ourselves back onto the subject matter which we must deal with. Here is the point. We have discussed the corruption of Rome that sort of precipitated, snowballed, you know, into the Protestant Reformation. Now, what I'm telling you now is that as you survey the church scene, as you look at the world today, you can actually make a case that we are as bad as the situation was in the 16th century, more than 500 years ago, or we are actually worse. It's one of two things. Either we are the same as it was then, or we've actually become worse. In either case, we need another reformation is what I'm saying. Now, after the reformation came about and uh, the revival of truths were brought about, true religion was restored, um, the gospel was restored back in its place and people were being converted, that church of Rome responded almost immediately by constituting a council in the year 1545, a council that ran for years actually. It was an ecumenical council. We usually call it, in history books, it is called the Council of Trent or Tridentine Council, as some would like to call it, Tridentine Council or the Council of Trent. The big wigs, over 40 bishops and cardinals, the big men of the Roman Catholic Church gathered together for to consider the teachings of the Reformation and to form a response that will counter the Reformation. Now, there are many things that were decided by that Council of Trent, things which we shall not go into for purposes of time and because it is not the purview of our subject tonight. But I want to deal with two things particularly, or rather refer to two things, particularly the, the Council of Trent in the year 1545. Now, that's just about 25 years you know, after Luther nailed his thesis, and only one year after, <coughs> I mean, to the death of Luther. Because I think Luther died in the year 1546, if I'm not wrong. <clears throat> Could be wrong on that one. But they sought to respond to the Reformation. This is what we call the Counter-Reformation. To roll back the gains that had been accrued during the Protestant Reformation. Now, I'm going to only make reference to two, like I've said. One... The Council of Trent said categorically the doctrine of sola scriptura. The doctrine of sola scriptura. They said you cannot say that the Bible alone is enough for faith and practice of the Christian person. They said, you know, the Bible is good. We affirm the Bible, the Council of Trent said, but it is not the Bible as we know it today with 66 books. The Catholic Bible has more books to it, which we usually call the Apocrypha, the Apocrypha, the Apocrypha, Maccabees, Tobit, Judith, Esther's, Wisdom, you know, books like that. All right? And they said, as they are contained in the earliest Septu sorry, um, Latin Vulgate, which I think was comp compiled by Jerome. The Council of Trent insisted that the Bible is only complete when it has those additional 
uh, texts of scripture. Now, of course, you know, we talked about Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19. If anybody adds, if anybody subtracts, they have uh, a reckoning with God to that extent. But they also said that alongside that, you know, convoluted volume of canon, we must also accept oral traditions as they have been handed down Things that were supposedly said by Christ, which were not written down. Things that were supposedly said by the apostles, which were not written down. And so on and so forth. So they denied the doctrine of sola scriptura. We find that continuing even today. Now, I won't spend time here because I have beat upon this path for so long. That today, even among Protestant churches, among evangelical churches, we find the doctrine of sola scriptura being fought vehemently, being denied. How is it being denied? It is being denied when people claim that we don't need the Bible alone, that we need the Bible, but we also need dreams. We need the Bible, but we also need visions. We need the Bible, but we also need new prophecies for the so-called men of God. Now again, I remind you, I've written a book on this one called The Disease Called God Told Me. It's on Amazon. It's on sale as we speak. And actually, there is a publication that is coming out, I think, in the month of March. It is with the publishers in Australia, Tully Publishing. We'll be releasing that title again, a fresh, a redone version of that title. In that book, I argue that today we've lost the way. We've gone off the faith. We've wandered into what Paul would have called vain jungling vain discussions we've wandered away and so what happens then is that we need a reformation that will in fact restore us to the doctrine of solar scriptura but the second thing that the council of trent in 1545 vehemently trained its guns towards was this pivotal doctrine of justification by faith alone this idea that we are accounted righteous only on the merit of jesus christ and without works apart from the works of the law we are accounted righteous the church of rome rejected that in fact they pronounced anathemas that i find and by the way i recommended that book to you at the beginning of our course together unquenchable flame by michael reeves introducing the reformation now, on page 176 of this book, obviously published by IVP, InterVarsity Press, on page 176, Michael Reeves here helps us to recapture those anathemas that were pronounced by the Church of Rome. In Canon 9, right, of the Council of Trent, Canon number 9, they say, if anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, let him be anathema. In other words, let him be cast. Canon 11. I'm on page 176 of this book, Unquenchable Flames, introducing the Reformation by Michael Reeves. Canon 11. If anyone says that men are justified either solely by the imputation of Christ's righteousness or solely by the remission of sins to the exclusion of the grace and charity which is poured into their hearts by the Holy Spirit and stays with them, or also that the grace by which we are justified is only the good will of God, let him be anathema. This is the Church of Rome. Canon 12, they return to that matter. If anyone says that justifying faith is nothing else than trust in divine mercy, which is the Protestant idea, that is the Reformation idea. They say if anybody says that, if anyone says that justifying faith is nothing else than trust in divine mercy, which remits sins for Christ's sake, let him be anathema, says the Church of Rome. This is the Council of Trent, the biggest ecumenical council, most profound, I think, in terms of its implications to the doctrine of the established Roman Catholic Church. Canon 24, Canon 24, Canon 24, they return to this matter, the Council of Trent. If anyone says that the righteousness received is not preserved and also not increased before God through good works, but that those works are merely the fruits and signs of justification obtained, but not the cause of the increase, let him be anathema. 
trend. The Church of Rome has never renounced trend. Nor Vatican I, nor Vatican II. This remains the official position of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, recently, I think about 10 years ago, maybe less, we had this movement calling itself ECT, Evangelicals and Catholics Together, ECT, dialoguing to find common ground. And they were saying that, in fact, the distinction, the differences between Protestants and Catholics are merely semantics. They are not that big. Brothers and sisters, the Council of Trent confirms that the Church of Rome repudiates, anathematizes the gospel, and we cannot have anything to do with them in the way of reaching a consensus on those things. They either drop their position or we have no thing to do with them. So the Council of Trent, then by those anathemas, did confirm that they are denying the gospel. But remember that in our time today, there are many that deny the gospel. There are many that reject the saving gospel. People are now wanting to be saved by works. Trying hard. Try hard. Keep going. Attend fellowship. Give your offering. Plant a seed. Repent many times. Keep short accounts with God, people are urged, in order to justification. That is a morass of Roman Catholicism. We need a reformation. But then I must discuss with you what I believe are six things we must do very quickly now. Very quickly, we're gaining speed now. Six things that we must do in view of our times and in view of attempting, by the grace of God, to do our part in preparing for a reformation for a renewal, for a revival. One, we must insist on a return to biblical preaching. That's number one. We must insist on a return to biblical preaching. Now, we've already anticipated this point yesterday when we were dealing with the preached word and the Reformation. The lecture yesterday was the preached word and the Reformation. We anticipated this discussion somewhat. But we are only emphasizing now that those of us who are engaged with teaching the people must be clear in our minds that a revival will not come, a Reformation will not come, a transformation will not come, a change will not come, the restoration of uh, true religion will not come until we return to true, authentic, biblical preaching. And I described that yesterday as having three characteristics. One, it is central to the life of the church and ministry. Three, two, it is exclusively preaching. And three, it is accurate preaching of the word of God. We must insist on it. Earlier today, I was addressing my diploma class at the Wisdom Training Center School of Ministry and Theology. We are having a diploma class. We are currently dealing with a course we are calling Renewal and Reform. Renewal and Reform. Now, obviously, these videos as well that we are recording live in our class lectures are also available on our YouTube channel so you can access them. Now, I was making the point today that there is no significant move of God. There is nothing God has done that is of significance on the earth which did not include or rather begin with him speaking to the situation. In other words, nothing happens apart from preaching. Now you know that there is no salvation apart from preaching. James chapter 1 verse 18 tells us that of his own will he has brought us forth by the word of God. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 23, he says of his, he has begat us to a living hope not by corruptible seed, but by the incorruptible seed of the word of God. Ephesians 1 and 13, and you believed. After that, you heard the gospel of your salvation. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21, he says to us that God was pleased to save through the foolishness of that which we preach. And even sanctification through the preached word, growth through the preached word. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15 and 16 and 17. So the word of God sits at the beginning of all change. There cannot be genuine change away from the word of God. 
You could have plutonic change. You could have some kind of things that look like change but aren't really change when in fact you do gimmicks, you do drama, you do storytelling. But we must insist on a return to the preaching of the word of God. Number two, number two, if we are angling for a reformation, if we are angling for revival, if we are angling for a renewal, if we are angling for God's move in our time, we must, number two, return to the insistence of a personal, experiential relationship with God. A personal, experiential relationship with God. Now, I wish I had time excuse me, to deal more with this because one of the things that was the underbelly, was the Achilles heels of the Protestant Reformation, one of the things that caused the Protestant Reformation not to proceed in the way it should have proceeded, not to progress in the way it should have progressed is that in fact there was a point in time that that insistence on a personal and experiential relationship with God was substituted by other things. For example, this idea, and we touched upon it in our previous lectures, this idea of a sacral society, of everybody who comes into church becomes a member of church. We don't investigate their profession of faith. So you had things like, that's Catholic France, that's Catholic Spain, that is Protestant England. You know, Protestantism was sort of reduced to a national identity. And that was a big problem. That was a big problem. There has been a saying that God has no grandchildren. God has only children. God has no grandchildren. I don't get saved by God and automatically my children become saved because I'm saved. God has no grandchildren. Even my children must have a personal and experiential relationship with God. So you had that first generation of reformers who had an encounter with God, a personal experiential relationship with God. But sadly, as time went, that insistence kind of died. And people began to join Protestantism because it was a label. That is the same way that people join churches today, as a label. We do not have a new birth, resurrection from the dead, a spiritual change, something happening in my heart that makes me a believer in Christ at a personal and at an experiential level. So that in fact, I am a believer in Christ regardless of my forebearers. I love what Dr. Peter Masters, the pastor at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, Peter Masters in his presentation, a contrast of the covenants, a Baptist explanation. This is the message. Peter Master says that in fact that was the seed of destruction that was inherent in what we call magisterial reformers. This is Luther. This is Calvin. This is Zwingli. People who thought because they had been converted, therefore the nation should be converted. We can have the whole nation coming in. Today you hear things like Kenya for Jesus, America for Jesus. You hear a prophet going around saying, oh, repent Kenya. Come back to God, Kenya. As if God is calling nations to repent. No, 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 no. In the days of ignorance, we read in Acts chapter 17 and verse 31, God overlooked, but now he commands everyone, not every nation, not every community, everyone, everywhere to repent. Personal and experiential relationship with God. Churches are dying. Ministries are dying. Because the founders may have been good people. They, have had, they may have had a personal, experiential relationship with God. But the same is not transferred to the people that come after them. The people that come after them. They assume then that somehow they are Christians because they are attending church. No, we must insist 
on a personal and experiential relationship with God. Because ladies and gentlemen, revival will come using live calls. Live calls. When somebody is born again, becomes a Christian, bona fide member of the kingdom of God, they are like a lively call. A burning call that will come and cause others to burn as well. But if you collect dead wood, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot have a revival. So we must insist on this. We must insist on this. Number three. Number three. And this is so important, I think. We must deliberately avoid an ecumenical frenzy. We must deliberately avoid an ecumenical frenzy frenzy we'll talk about an ecumenical frenzy i'm talking about the world now becoming a global village the world becoming a global village the world is tending to conglomerate to amalgamate to coalesce to unite the united nations international criminal court international court of justice unesco the east african community you know uh, in west africa you have the ECOWAS and COMESA over here and so on and so forth. AU, World Council of Churches, Kenya National Council of Churches or something, KC something there. It's, it's, it's an ecumenical body. Now why do I say we must avoid that? Because when we come together in an ecumenical spirit, what usually happens is that we, in fact, embrace people with spurious doctrines. And that is what Jesus says, a little leaven leavens the whole lamb, leavens the whole bread. We cannot have that. In the name of charity and tolerance, we have, in fact, invited into the church seeds of corruption, seeds of its own self-destruction. We must avoid this. And this is why our brothers who are sort of dialoguing with the Roman Catholic Church must stand advised that this is a dangerous and slippery path. This is a dangerous and slippery path. We don't want to go down this path. Usually in an ecumenical gathering, you must lose in position because you're trying to understand the other person and the other person is trying to understand you. You're trying to move some and they are trying to move some so that you can get to what they are calling now the least common denominator. Where ecumenical frenzy is to be found, there we also find a loosening and a lax of doctrine. We must refuse that. We must refuse that. We must be doctrinal people. We must be people of a firm conviction. We must be like Martin Luther, who said, here I stand, draw a line, and say, here I stand. Here in Kenya, we have so popular things called pastor's fellowships. These are ecumenical bodies. You find this person with a very wrong belief, the other person with a very wrong belief, they gather together because what? They want to raise funds for that other school. They want to raise funds so that we are investing ourselves in temporal things, material things at the expense and to the neglect of spiritual issues. We must make a deliberate avoidance of the ecumenical frenzy. Number four, we must return to simplicity in preaching in leadership and in worship. I think that is a very, very important thing. It's being complicated now. Simplicity in preaching, in leadership. The Bible talks about men uh, who are elders and deacons leading the church. We have these big hierarchies that came up and corrupted the church, the big man syndrome and all that. We must uh, resist that if we are to wait for a reformation. Number five. We must battle against humanism and new age concepts and philosophies invading the church. Humanism and new age philosophies invading the church. No. Self-help tricks, self-help gimmicks, motivational speaking, humanism, human potential, 
things like that. We must avoid that and return to the simplicity of the preached word of God. Simplicity of worship. Now, for more information on this, obviously, I will direct you to my book, Wielding the Sword of the Spirit. I have a lot of things that I'm saying there with regard to this particular matter. How might we recover that simplicity of preaching that doesn't uh, leverage on humanism and new age concepts? But I think number six then, if we are going to have a reformation, we must not only discover the spirit of prayer and a longing for a reformation, we must not only discover the spirit of prayer and a longing for a reformation, a longing for genuine true revival, but we must also recover biblical courage. Biblical courage. The courage of conviction. The courage to go against the tide. The courage to swim against the current. Ladies and gentlemen, it was not easy for Martin Luther to stand against the whole establishment of the Roman Empire, the whole monolithic regime of the Roman Catholic Church, the princes and the bishops and the cardinals breathing down his neck. It was not easy. It took the courage of conviction. Courage of conviction. Where is our courage today? Where is our courage? We will be labeled fanatics, but we must recover our courage. We will be labeled fundamentalists, but we must recover our courage. We will be labeled sectarian and parochial, myopic, short-sighted, unloving, mean people for standing with the truth of God. We will be called killjoys, but you must have the courage of your convictions. Where is our courage today? We need preachers who will speak truth to power, powerfully, and say, here, I stand. I have drawn the line. At this point, I am not moving. Our problem, if I may say in closing, is the desire to be loved, desire to be accepted, our desire to succeed, desire to raise mega churches, desire to 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 self-actualize we put a premium on these things and in the process sacrifice the truth of the word of god we sacrifice the truth of the word of god where is our courage we must recover the courage of conviction the preachers needed today are not sermoniers and lecturers but preachers of the gospel of christ Martin Luther once said, where the battle rages, the fiercest, there the fealty and the faithfulness of the soldier is most tested and established there at the front lines where the battle rages hot. Where is our courage? In the face of dwindling numbers, where is our courage? When what we say is unpopular, where is our courage? When what we say does not win us friends, does not win us members, does not win us following, does not win us success, does not bring many, does not bring people. Where is our courage? The history of the Reformation is a history of courage. The history of change is a history of courage. Cowards will never lead a reform. Cowards will never lead a reform. We need the conviction, the courage of conviction. But ladies and gentlemen, I must restate, praying and desiring revival. I'm a firm believer in revival. I know it's a sovereign move of God. I know it comes when God wills it. It is a work of God. I know this. But I'm laboring in Western Kenya, in Mumiasia, in Africa, wherever God sends me. I labor to confront the melody of the times because the more we roll back the darkness, the more light is given space. And peradventure, God willing in his own time, we might just experience revival. I may die without God bringing that revival in my lifetime, but I will still hope for it. I will still pray for it. I will still work for it. I refuse to go through this life perfunctorily. I refuse to be a preacher who only fulfills his career, fulfills his duty. I have a desire in my heart like David. Will you revive us again, O oh Lord, that your people should rejoice? Do you have that desire as a preacher? 
as a member of church, as a Christian man or woman? Do you have a desire? Do you have this longing that God will visit our land again with rain? That it will rain, that righteousness will be restored, that holiness will be restored, that charity will be restored, love will be restored. God will move again in our day. Do you have that desire? Then you must have the courage to work for it, to stand for it. I want to thank you so very much for having joined me to, in these lectures and staying with me for three weeks. Uh, nine lectures altogether, nine days altogether. It's been a lovely time being with you. Again, I will take a break and uh, I don't know what the Lord has for us in the future. My wife and I were discussing that probably I need a break and uh, do other things. But I will be periodically coming with those one-off one lectures or one-off presentations you know, uh, but not a series like this for some time. But when we come up with a series that we think is going to be profitable for you, we're going to let you know that. We're going to let you know that. And so do visit our YouTube channel. Uh, it is uh, WTC Media Outreach is the name of our YouTube channel. WTC Media Outreach. And uh, while there, please do consider subscribing. Those of you who have not subscribed to the channel, please do consider subscribing. You will find more than 100 lectures actually done by me, either in my preaching seminars, conferences, or in class, or in special streamings like this ones. You will find on a wide variety of things. For example, now I'm doing renewal and reform, helping my diploma students to confront the maladies in their own churches. Many of them are pastors. And those lectures are being recorded and they're being posted on our YouTube channel. You can visit and find content there. But you can also visit our website. It is at www.reformedgospel.org. www.reformedgospel.org. In fact, some of that will be scrolling down your screen. Those of you who are watching this by Facebook Live, there is a, a, a scroll on your screen you can find our email address which is email wtc media at gmail.com all one word all small caps email wtc media at gmail.com is our email address but uh, you can also visit our website like i said www.reformedgospel.org you can reach us by that telephone number scrolling across your screen for any question for any help plus two five four two five four is our country code plus two five four Seven two two six six five four seven seven. It's a number that will be scrolling at the bottom of your screen as well. And uh, we trust that the Lord will bless us together. Continue praying for us. And those of our brothers and sisters who are in the USA, the United States of America, the land of the free and home of the brave, the superpower, the global police, we tell you, brothers and sisters, whatever the results of this election, whether Donald Trump regains his seat or Biden wins this presidency. I have posted today earlier on on Facebook, the Lord God Omnipotent is on his throne. The Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. Do not be troubled. Do not be troubled in your hearts. A Biden presidency will not be the end of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, with its all anti-God agenda, that leftist political agenda, all that, notwithstanding, we know how bad it is. But Jehovah, if Biden becomes president, it will be because God allowed it. And all things work together for good to those that love the Lord, even them that are called according to his purpose. Here is one thing that never changes. Biden might change. Trump might change. Democrats, Republicans might change. All this might change. This one thing doesn't change. God has called you to preach the gospel, whether Biden is president or whether Trump is president. God has called you to preach the gospel. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a constant that doesn't change. Nevertheless, we pray for you, America, because in many ways, what happens in your country in the morning reaches us in Africa by the same afternoon, the world being the global village. And also we pray for America. We pray for you guys that God will give you peace through these very difficult times that you're going through as a country. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Until we meet again for another live stream, I say bye-bye from Kenya here. See you next time, people.